Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, my name is Russ Conway, and tonight I'm here because HTV have honoured me by deciding to do an hour's programme on my life in here in this city of Bristol where I was born and raised. I have some guests for you, some with us here in the studio, some who will be filmed and you'll see later on. And we were going back in the 30 years I've been in show business. of his talent has remained untapped. If he'd have been an American, God knows where he would have gone, you know what I mean? Millions and millions of records he was selling, you know, that lovely honky-tonk style that was his own that he invented. I always think of Russ as the kind of boy next door. In fact, that was the image that I tried to promote on records, that, um, he was the kind of boy that lived next door and you went in and said, oh, give us a tune, Russ. I mean, that to me is the songs in art. I used to stand on this corner on Tuesday evenings, Tuesday, late Tuesday afternoons and Friday afternoons, waiting for my father, who was a commercial travel agent in a sweet business. And he'd come home, especially on Fridays, and I'd be standing here waiting for him. Sometimes he used to walk halfway up Coronation Road here to get to him, so that I'd have a ride on the handlebars or, or on the bar before the law stopped all that. But mainly we used to wait for him on Fridays for his samples, because he'd bring home the, his end of the week samples to start afresh on Monday. And of course by Monday in the morning, with three boys, there were no living samples left, were there? We'd raided his case. It was all gone, we were full of chocolate all over our mouths and everything. So we used to get a belting, a regular belting, and you know, it was good fun. Dad was first and foremost a military man. So he brought us up with a certain amount of military discipline. He was in charge of the barracks at Devizes, where Ralph was born. And I think it's where he married Mother in 1915. His name was Herbert Stanford. Maybe that's why I am called Clever Herbert. I don't know where Hubert comes from. Ralph has got Hubert. He's William Ralph Hubert Stanford. Philip is Philip Edwin. I don't know where Edwin comes from. We were first of all at the back bedroom, weren't we? That's right, yeah. yeah. And then we moved into the front. Yeah. You had that a bedroom. Yeah. Well, I had the side bedroom. What was it, the side bedroom where you sang the bell, bell out? Yeah. And drop it on Mother? Yeah. yeah. And it was from that window then that we used to watch the nunnery. Oh yeah. And, yeah. and, <laughs> and be good be on good. Sunday morning. <coughs> it's nice to come back again, isn't it? The front doesn't look too um has too bad. changed an awful no, lot. No. no. That one that you and the girls you and Philip used to sleep in here. And you were in there. Indeed, yeah. We had a double bed here. When we went into the old bedroom, our old bedroom, looking out of that window there I remember mainly back to the early days of the war. We used to be able to watch all the dog fights over the city, the planes coming down, and at night, of course, it was beautifully horrendous to see the lights on the planes and watching the bombers come over and some of them being caught by the ACAC, the anti-aircraft fire. And I remember thinking, this is history we're watching here. But isn't it amazing how, as you get older, everything becomes smaller? This used to be a very, very large room to me. It was a it large, was large room. It was large. I had to take probably Philip and Trev with me most of the places I went because they were younger than I. We got on very well together, all three of us. Uh, Trevor and I got on more, I think, better because Philip was more of a loner. He used to go off, he was courting a girl as well. And Trevor was more, he and I were more together than anything else. He was very protective towards me uh, because I, I, th I think he wanted to be, apart from the fact that mother always used to say, take Trevor with you, but look after him, look after Trevor. You know. And um, he always did. He was very protective, except when I was tightrope walking on serrated edge railings. 
done. And he gave me a little push to see. <laughs> Go on, he said, go on a little further, and I, I slipped, you see, and I went down with my legs wide open, and I still got the scar to prove it, but I survived. You know, I survived, and everything, all the, all the bits and pieces worked throughout the years, fortunately. But it was um, a pretty traumatic experience, that was, absolutely. Both mother and father were musical themselves. Mother was a contralto, father was a tenor, and they sang in local opera at society, and encouraged all three of us. Uh, Trevor um, just showed a natural talent. My musical training, I suppose, started when the family found out I could naturally play the piano, which I'd, I'd showed around about the age of four or five. And Mother wanted me to take lessons, and I remember she sent me to lessons. I forget the name of the lady up in the top of Stackpole Road. She sent me for lessons, and I hated it, you see. And I used to kick her, and I think I'd, I took one officially. And then I kept the money in my pocket and went to the pictures. That was the, the start of the official musical training. The, most of it I'd picked up from Mother and watching her and listening to her play. He would listen to a, a, a song on the radio or any tune and would go into the, into the uh, lounge and within a moment or two he would hear the, the tune being played you know, purely from memory. Dad had bought a marvellous new HMV record player, an automatic record player where the 78 RPM records went clonk and the arms went crank, did crank, and then it, and it was a needle that we had to change practically every record or something, you see. And um, I automatically took to this, and I was able to, because the piano was in pitch with the machine, the, ra the radiogram, and I started playing the piano with recordings. I remember a tune called Jim Wouldn't Bring Me Any Pretty Flowers or something like that, and I found this in interesting to play the melody with the left hand thumb while sort of working harmonies into the right then. One of the composers which I have admired, and I just want to play this tune because I've admired so much of his music, his film music, and his method of composing. I haven't been able to, able to define it, uh, but here it is. It's a Henry Mancini tune entitled Charade, Charade, Charade. <laughs> He won a scholarship to All Saints Choral School by his voice. From there on, of course, uh, he was tied most of the time. Most days of the week, he would be at Eden Song or Madrigals or weddings. And Mother, of course, fussed with him. She was very proud of him. All Saints Choir School was very good for me musically, 
even though at the time I probably didn't like it all that much. There was a choir and I was able to learn to read music. I won something there. I came first in the sight reading class. Here again, this amazes me because later on in years to come when I became a full-blown professional, I found it very difficult to sight read music. Maybe it was nerves, but um, I remember as a boy, I won this prize for sight reading in the choir school. I was dragged off on the occasion of Sunday to All Saints Church to listen to him sing, particularly when he was singing solo. And I remember for one occasion he was due to sing Ave Maria and the church was absolutely packed. And Mother, of course, was a little bit tense. And all he was doing was typically, uh, as he always was, here, there and everywhere, even with his eyes, paying no attention. And Mother was nearly going completely desperate, thinking he was going to miss the key. And just without any warning, this beautiful uh, soprano voice uh, came in right on the key and uh, with no worry at all. That was the sort of attitude that he had towards it. He had uh, plenty of confidence. My mother had a photograph taken of me playing the organ at All Saints Church in Clifton. And from that, I got the urge to um, play organs in other churches. And I used to break in, break into churches. Some of them were open, most of them were open. I'd probably just walk through the door, but broke into the organ. And then I'd find the switch and I'd switch on the organ. I did it at St. Mary's Redcliffe, I did it at St. Nicholas, I did it at St. Paul's in Coronation Row. And I used to love making this sound. I thought, this enormous sound that little me is making, you know, four or five manuals on the, each four or five keyboards. Saturday morning was sort of clean up day, and in the afternoon, sunning about four o'clock, we all went shopping in Bedminster. East Street, it was called. We usually ended up in Brian's, and it's still there, Brian's seafood Can I have a shop. Half a quarter of shrimp, half a corn, seal, and a plate of cockles. The dad would have winkles and cockles, and we'd have a plate of cockles each, and maybe a plate of winkles each. And then after that, nip around the corner to a chitling and tripe shop and pig's trotters. Now, the result of all the pig's trotters, the peanuts, the chocolate mint, the uh, winkles and the cockles, sort of boiled up together, so pardon the expression. And the next morning, we belled to be and waited until I got to church. And about halfway through the service, they wanted to make themselves known again. As we grew up, we grew up together, more or less. It was only the war that broke everything up. When Trevor went his well, Trevor went into the Navy, and I went into the RAF. And then mother dying, of course, and father getting married again, literally broke up the home and broke up the family. And we both went our own separate ways. After mother had died, I came back to Bristol, looking for a job and not knowing where to settle. I used to go into the YMCA to and just play the piano with a lot of troops, of course, up in Colston Street, you see. In Bristol, there weren't a lot of pubs with pianos, at least not that I could say, because I was underage, anyway. Uh, it wasn't until I got in the Navy and then went to live in London that I played in, in pubs, and all the pubs in South East London. I don't think there's one I didn't play in that had a decent piano.
wanted to, there is such a thing I think as the call of the sea, and I wanted to go back to sea. So I did three voyages on the Canton to the Far East and then joined the Strathmore. When I joined the Royal Navy, <laughs> I had five whole fingers on this hand. And then we had what we call work ship week, where you stopped training to be a signalman, which I was training for, and they put you in all around the ship to had so you learn roughly how to clean the ship or you become domesticated. Dad had all, already done that, actually. He taught the three of us how to cook, how to darn our socks, how to wash our laundry and everything from his military training of his. But come work ship week, in the old days, before the sliced loaf that made that changed the world, we used to have the long, long loaves, you know, in the military, and this cutting machine where one boy stood at the end turning the handle and two feet away was another lad, on this occasion, twas your truly, taking the slices away from the blade, you see, and the blade going, ka-chung, 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 going round and round. And suddenly I thought, oh, and I said, stop, and he said, what, and he went round again, you see. And I, um, unconsciously, I put my hand back again to take another slice of bread, and the, and the blade took another slice of my finger. So there was, <laughs> wicked, and I didn't feel a thing, you see. Anyway, we finally got back to England via Margate, where I went to have my fortune told. I said, Jeff, come on in and have your fortune told. He wouldn't have it, he doesn't believe in it. I went in and this lady said, you're in show business. I said, no, I'm not. She said, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not, I'm a merchant sailor. She said, well, then you're going to be in show business very, very soon. And I had no ambitions, no intentions at all. Anyway, we got back to Windsor, and Jeff and I broke up. Jeff lived in Windsor. I came up to London to, uh, to get a job playing in a club where I was seen and heard by Irving Davis, choreographer, who then brought in Norman Newell, who was to become my recording manager. And this was all within four weeks of the day in Margate. And literally four weeks after that day, I find myself slammed in the middle of show business, being writing writing tunes, composing, I've never done that in life, for Irving Davis, and being Norman Newell's audition pianist for Columbia Record House. What about that? He was introduced to me by one of our famous choreographers named Irving Davis, in my capacity as a lyric writer, because I also write lyrics, um, I've had two careers, and he said he'd heard this boy playing certain tunes, and he thought that he would make a wonderful composer for me. So he brought him round to meet me, and I was absolutely in agreement with him. He writes wonderful melodies. And we became quite a successful songwriting team. Norman helped me become a song plugger and introduced me to Teddy Holmes, the boss of Chapels, who gave me a job there as song plugging, which uh, it was not an easy job at all. You were almost begging to give something away. You know, no, people mistrust you if you try and give away things, don't they? Anyway, it wasn't an easy job. One had to, you were given a song to plug, to make famous, try and get it into the hip parade. Through the song plugging, I was able to demonstrate the songs in the office. And many singers would come in and say, well, we've well, got new songs for the broadcast. One of them was Dennis Lotus, who seemed to become a firm, firm, jolly good friend. And Dennis asked me if I'd become his, uh, go out with a band. My piano player that I had working with me at the time had gone back to Canada and I was doing a concert with the Johnny Vanquist band on a Sunday and I needed a pianist to accompany me. So I said to Russ, uh, would you like to play for me for the concert on Sunday? And he said, well, I don't know about that solo. He said, well, okay, I will. So I went out on the Sunday and he'd given me his music and his records and I was able to pick up music easier by listening to them than reading the music albeit this sight reading prize that I got when I was a kid at All Saints wasn't sort of standing me in too much good stead at the time. Because it was professional stuff and I couldn't read chord symbols, you know, I could read the, the musical line, but I couldn't read chord symbols. I still find that very difficult. We rehearsed and everything, and he was fine. He couldn't read music, but he had a marvelous ear. And he phoned me on the Friday and said, uh, Will Fife Jr.'s in town. Ask him to do it. <laughs> I said, don't be ridiculous. If you don't do it now, you'll never do it. So he came along with me and we did this concert, I think it was a, in Ipswich. At the end of the show, I had made so many mistakes, so many, 
that I thought he'll never employ me again. And we were driving home, he was doing the driving, and there was a bit of silence for about the first 80 miles, and he turned to me and said, I've got another concert next week with the Jack Parnell Orchestra, would you like to do that? And for that, I shall always be grateful, more than grateful, but he knows how much. He's here with us tonight, to my lovely good friend, Mr. Dennis Lotus. <laughs> We've worked with Dankworth and Barn Allen the best, haven't we, yes. you and I? But one of the songs which you used to sing, and I'd like you to sing it for me tonight, it was one of the best songs I think you ever sung. It's called I'm in the Mood for Love. Will you? Uh, Are you really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, I am godfather to one of your sons. Yes, you are. Yeah, thank you very much. He's godfather to one of my sons. Sort of mention it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go on. Forget it. 